Welcome to the first of the SSA web lecture series. This first lecture is concerned with getting across the real basics of the finite element method and hopefully giving people new to the technology a real kind of basic background in what a finite element model is and how it does it. Now we're going to try and achieve this with a minimum of kind of hard mathematics. We're just going to look at the concepts and the basic kind of structure of a finite element model and how it works. Armed with that knowledge, hopefully, you should then be able to kind of start investigating what and how they do it in, in more detail and go on from that point. But there is a definite point at which it's worth understanding what a finite element model's got in it and, and how that allows it to make the predictions and perform the simulations that we all know they can do. So here we start off, we're going to kick off with the most basic of graphics. And this, this graphic hopefully highlights a good number of the points of a finite element model and gives you an idea of the concept of what it's all about. And that concept is using lump spring stiffnesses or spring stiffness representations between calculation points to represent the behaviour of an overall structure. So in this picture here we can see that we've got a load of springs, we've got some straights and we've got some forces, and the way in which the, the structure, the block, which is represented in green, is, is, is kind of simulated is by using that representation of spring stiffnesses. So, if we think about spring stiffness and the physics of elasticity, the first name that really springs to mind is Robert Hooke. So we see one of the few surviving pictures of Robert Hooke here. And next to Robert, we have a picture of the kind of experimental work he was doing concerning the stiffness of springs. So, one of the things that he was very famous for was Hooke's law, obviously, and that is a relationship that governs how spring stiffness is proportional to load and displacement. He went a lot further than that. And if we have a look at one of his papers, this paper is downloadable from the internet, and in fact for about $25 you can download this from a, a number of websites. Here we have uh, a very advanced concept that he came up with, which was that he could represent something like a beam structure with a rays of spring stiffnesses. And you can see that he's drawn a mesh of springs upon the beam element and use that as a predictive model. Now that, I think, is pretty impressive for when it was done because it was done in the late 17th century. It was a very long time ago. So, anyway, Hooke's law, force equals stiffness times change in length, is a, a predictive thing that will allow us to tell how much a spring uh, extends when we apply a force to it if we know its stiffness. A very simple physical law, perhaps the first time that uh, equation was used to describe some physical behaviour. So, if we take the simplest finite element that it's possible to create, and it's possible to create these in systems like Abacus, we can take a single spring element. That single spring element has two calculation points. At the ends of the spring, we can, we can extend it. Um, we, can we can fix the spring at a calculation point. We can apply a force. And force equals stiffness times change in length can be used to determine how that system is going to behave. If we take the kind of mathematics and the uh, description of what's going on a stage further, if we look at somebody who works in the 19th century, a guy called J.J. Sylvester, he works on matrix theory. Probably he wasn't the person who invented matrices, but he certainly worked on developing them. And we can take the basic physics of Hooke's law and we can kind of put that in matrix form. If you, like me, had to work through multiplying matrices through a, through a secondary school, you can see that we've got some, a common vector of forces, a matrix of stiffnesses and a common vector of displacements. If we multiply the, the stiffnesses times the displacements, it's equal to the force, and those are in equilibrium. So F equals Kx is now described in matrix form. Now that may look like an overhead, may look like something that hasn't brought anything to the party, but it really allows you to do something very clever. And that is to superimpose systems of springs, which will then have a more complicated, a bigger array of force equals stiffness times uh, deflection. So we multiply that out, we still get the same sort of thing. But we now have an array, or we now have a system, which predicts and allows us to calculate what multiple springs will do when they're, calc when they're connected together. So this, this, uh, this kind of description here is a description of what the two springs will do. And 
it will create a system of simultaneous equations. It is a system of simultaneous equations. If we solve those simultaneous equations, we'll end up with the deflections. So we can use uh, a very straightforward process to calculate what an array of springs is going to do. That array of springs, in the initial simple ca case that we've shown, is just one after the other single degree of freedom system. But we can arrange those spring stiffnesses in different ways. And if we arrange those spring stiffnesses to bound blocks of material, we can create a representation that it can be used to represent physical blocks of stuff, like steel, like plastic, whatever. So we have numbers of different ways of doing this. Different ways of arranging spring stiffnesses are called elements. But here we have two the kind of traditional finite elements. We've got a, a four-noded, uh, sorry, eight-noded brick and a four-noded tetrahedron. These, well, you can see it more explicitly with the, uh, the tetrahedral element. There's a low, definitely lower order tetra. We can see that we've got spring stiffness along the boundary of the element and they join up all the nodes. Same sort of thing, more kind of idealized in the, in the graphics we've used in the eight-noded brick. But we can use networks of springs to represent bumps of material, and that's critical. If we return to the initial graphics we used, hopefully you can see in a bit more kind of, it's a bit more straightforward now, we have the calculation points, we have lumps of material bounded by spring elements or spring stiffnesses, they're, they're elements. And then we've got a series of boundary conditions. We've got uh, restraints on the left-hand side, forces on the right-hand side. And we can see that we could use force equal stiffness times change in length and matrix theory to describe what happens. And then that model then becomes predictive. It will tell us what a lump of material of that shape and size will do. If we take a more complicated finite element model, here we have one with a much, much finer mesh. In fact, it's the kind of standard flat plate with the whole model. If we look at it in a bit more detail, you can see that it's got a whole series of calculation points where the lines join and those lines represent stiffnesses. This model gives rise to a whole series of simultaneous equations that are solved to give us the displacements. Once we've calculated those displacements, we can calculate what those displacements do in terms of applying stress or what they do in creating a stress field inside each individual element. So in terms of what we've got, this slightly more complicated model is using exactly the same concepts and techniques as the graphic we used previously. Now, we can use the finite element model to, or the finite element technique to calculate more than just displacements and stresses. We can use it for heat transfer, for vibration, we can even use it for fluid flow and all sorts of other things like that. But it provides us with a basic way of calculating responses across complicated geometries. And those complicated geometries are simply represented by calculating or distributing spring stiffnesses around the geometry in the meshing process. So hopefully, that's given you a brief indication of what a finite element model is. It's an array of springs, and it uses Hooke's law to calculate, or extensions of Hooke's law to calculate the behavior and the performance. So hopefully, with that basic understanding, we can create a kind of jumping up or point to understand more complicated, more serious implications when it comes to the finite element method. And that will be the subject, of, they will be the subjects of later lectures. So thank you very much for your attention and hopefully you'll join us for the next in the series.